uh, hello. I just wanted to say before this starts that, um, well, I'm not sure how many of you know me. I was on, you probably don't know it, but it was called Book Reader's Mind before it shut down. It wasn't that popular, not to mention only up for two days. And most people didn't know me on there anyways. But if you did, and I'm here now. And this is my re-uploading of the Snow White reading. The other reading got lost, so sorry about that. Um, so hello, I am White Francis, and I will be reading Snow White. It was the middle of winter, and the snowflakes were falling like feathers from the sky. And a queen sat at her window working. Her embroidered frame was of and bony, and as she worked, gazing at the times on the shadows, she pricked her finger, and there fell from it three drops of blood on the snow. And she saw how bright and red it looked. She said to herself, Oh, if I could have a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood of the embering frame. Not very long after, she had a daughter, with skin as white as snow, lips as red as blood, and hair as black as and bony. She was named Snow White, and when she was born, the queen died. You know, um, actually not a part of the story. I always used to wonder why in stories the parents would die or, you know, get killed off or written off in such way. But I think some sort of it's like an appeal. Well, not that people want parents dead, but it makes the character more um, three, you know, in lots of stories, parents are killed off and run out because children like reading about children, but it's hard to write about, like, a cool adventure or a scary story when a parent is there and most likely trying to care or stop, you know, the child from doing the thing in the story. Um, and it always does make me wonder that whenever I think about, like, anything odd that has happened to me. My parents were never a big part in any of them. Oh gosh, I'm rambling. I'm back to the story. Sorry. After a year had gone, the king had took another wife, a beautiful woman, but proud and overbearing, and she could not bear to be suppressed in beauty by anyone. She had a magic looking glass, and she used it to stand before it, look at it, and say, Looking glass upon the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the looking glass would answer, you are the fairest of them all. And she was content, for she knew that the looking glass only spoke the truth. Now Snow White was growing prettier and prettier. By the time she was seven years old, she was as beautiful as day, far more so than the queen herself. So one day the queen went up to a mirror and said, looking glass, looking glass, Upon the wall, who is the fairest of them all? It answered, Queen, you are full fair, tis true, but Snow White fairer is than you. This gave the queen a great shock, and she became yellow and green with envy, and from that hour her heart turned against Snow White, and she hated her. With envy and pride like ill weeds grew from her heart at higher every day until she had no peace day or night. At last she sent for a huntsman and said, Take the child out into the woods, so that I may set eyes on her no more. You must put her to death and bring me her heart for a token. The huntsman concealed and led her away, but then he drew his cut glass to pierce Snow White's innocent heart. She began to weep and to say, Oh, dear Hutsman, do not take my life. I will go away into the wild woods and never come home again. And she was so lovely, the Hutman had pity on her. And he said, Away with you then, poor child, for he thought the wild animals would be sure to devour her. And it was as if a stone had been rolled away from his heart that he did not put her to death. Just at that moment, a young wild boar came running by, so he caught and killed it, and took out its heart. He brought it back to the queen, for a token, and it was salted and cooked, 
and the wicked woman ate it up, thinking there was an end of Snow White. Now, when the poor child found herself quite alone in the wild woods, she felt full of terror, even of the very leaves on the trees, and she did not know what to do for fright. Then she began to run over the sharp stones, and through the thorn bushes, and the wild beast after her, but they did her no harm. She ran as long as her feet would carry her, and when the evening drew near, she came to a little house, and then she went inside. Everything there was very small, but as pretty and clean as possible. There stood a little table ready laid and covered in a white cloth, and seven little plates, and seven knives and forks and drinking cups. By the wall stood seven little beds, side by side, covered with clean white quilts. Snow White, being very hungry and thirsty, ate from each plate a little porridge and bread, and drank out of each little cup a drop of wine, so as not to finish up one portion alone. After that, she felt so tired that she lay down on one of the beds, but it did not seem to suit her. It was too long, another too short, but the last of the seventh was quite right, so she laid down on it, committed herself to the heavens, and fell asleep. When it was quite dark, the masters of the house came home. There were seven dwarves who all occupied was to dig underground amongst the mountains. They had lighted their seven candles, and it was quite light to be in the house. They saw that someone must have been in, as everything was not in the same order as which they left. The first one said, Who has been sitting in my chair? The second one said, Who has been eating from my plate? The third one said, Who has been taking my loaf? The fourth one said, Who has been tasting my porridge? The fifth one said, Who has been using my fork? The sixth one said, Who has been cutting with my knife? The seventh one said, Who has been drinking from my cup? Then the first one, looking around, saw a hollow in his bed and cried, Who has been laying in my bed? The others came running too and cried, Someone has been in our beds too. But when the seventh one looked at his bed, he saw little Snow White lying there asleep. Then he told the others who came running, crying in their astonishment and holding up their seven candles to throw a light upon Snow White. Oh goodness, oh gracious, they cried. What a beautiful child that is. And were so full of joy to see her that they did not wake her but let her sleep on. And the seven dwarfs slept with his comrades an hour at a time with each one till the night had passed. When it was morning and Snow White awoke and saw the seven dwarfs, she was very frightened. But they seemed quite friendly and asked her what her name was. She told them, and then they asked her how she came into their house. And she relayed them how her stepmother had wished her to be put to death and how the hutman had spared her life, and how she had been running the whole day long, until at last she had found their house. The dwarf said, If you will keep our house for us, and cook, and wash, and make beds, and sew, and knit, and keep everything tidy and clean, you may stay with us, and you shall lack nothing. With all my heart, said Snow White, and so she stayed, and kept the house in good order, in the mornings, the dwarf went to the mountain to dig for gold. In the evenings, they came back, and their supper had been ready for them. All day long, the maiden was left alone, and the good dwarves warned her, saying, Beware of your stepmother. She will soon know you are here. Let no one into the house. Now the queen, having eaten Snow White's heart, as she supposed, felt quite sure that now she was the first and fairest. And so she came to her mirror and said, Looking glass, looking glass upon the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the glass answered, Queen, thou art of beauty rare, but Snow White, living in the glean, with the seven little men, is a thousand times more fair. Then she was very angry, for the glass always spoke the truth, and she knew that the huntman must have deceived her, and that Snow White must still be living. And she thought and thought of how she could manage to make an end to her, for as long as she was not the fairest in the land, envy left her no rest. At last she thought of a plan. She painted her face and dressed herself like an old peddler woman, so that no one would have known it was her, 
In disguise, she went across to the seven mountains until she came on the house of the seven dwarves and knocked at the door and cried. Snow White put her head out of the window and said, I dare not let anybody in. The seven dwarves told me not to. All right, answered the woman. I can easily get rid of my apples elsewhere. There, I will give you one. No, answered Snow White. I dare not take anything. Are you afraid of poison? said the woman. Here, look. I will cut the apple in two pieces. You should have the red side, I will have the white one. For the apple was so cunningly made that all of the poison was in the red half of it. Snow White longed for the beautiful apple. As she saw the pleasant woman eating a piece of it, she could no longer refrain, but stretched out her hand and took the poison half. But no sooner had she taken the morsel out of her mouth and then fell on the earth as dead. And the queen, casting on her a terrible glance, laughed aloud and cried, As snow is white, as red as blood, as black and envy. And when she went home and asked the looking glass, looking glass against the wall, who is the fairest of us all? At last it answered, You are the fairest now of all. And her envious heart had peace as much as an envious heart can have. The dwarves, as soon as they came home in this evening, found Snow White laying on the ground, and there came no breath from her mouth. She was dead. They lifted her up, sought if anything poisonous was found. But the poor child was dead and remained dead, and they laid her on a casket and sat all seven of them round to it and wept for three whole days and then they would have buried her, but that she still was if she were living with her beautiful, blooming cheeks. So they said, we cannot hide her away in the black ground. And they had made a coffin of clear glass, so as to be looked into from all sides. As they laid her in it, they wrote golden letters upon it her name, that she was a king's daughter, and they set the coffin up somewhere on a mountain, and one of them always refrained by to watch it. And the birds came up too, and mourned for Snow White. First an owl, then a raven, and lastly a dove. Now, now, for long Snow White laid in the coffin and never changed, but looked as if she were asleep, for she was still as white as snow, as red as blood, and her hair was as black as envy. Now one day a king's son rode through the woods and up to a dove's house, which was near it. He saw on the mountains a coffin, and beautiful Snow White written on it, and he read what was written on the golden letter upon it. Then he said to the dwarves, Let me have the coffin, and I will give you whatever you like to ask for it. But the wolves told him that they could not part with it, for all the gold in the world. But he said, I beg you to give it for me, for I cannot live without looking upon Snow White. He said, I will bring you great honor and care for you, as if you were my brethren. When he spoke so good, the dwarves had pity upon him, and gave him the coffin, and the king's son called his servant, bid them to carry it away on their shoulders. Now it happened as they were going along, stumbled around a bush, and with a little shaking, the bit of poison apple flew out of her mouth. It was not long before she opened her eyes, threw up the cover of the coffin, and sat up, alive, and well. Oh dear, where am I? she cried. The king's son answered, full of joy, or near me. And relating all that happened, he said, I would rather have you than anything in the world. Come be with me to my father's castle, and you shall be my bride. And Snow White was kind, and went with him. And their wedding was held with a pomp and great splendor. But Snow White's wicked stepmother was also invited to the feast. And when she had dressed herself in beautiful clothes, she went to her looking glass and said, Looking glass upon the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? And the looking glass answered, O oh queen, although you are of beauty rare, the young bride is a thousand times more fair. Then she railed and cursed, and there was beside her with disappointment and anger, for she thought that she would not go to the wedding. Then she felt as if she'd have no peace until she saw the bride. When she saw her, she knew for Snow White could not stir from the place for anger and terror, for they had ready hot iron shoes, in which she had to dance upon until she fell dead. Um, so that was Snow White by Brothers Grimm, read by White Francis. Um, you know, I 
I quite like this story, although for me personally, I always hear about, um, although there's some parts that's a bit odd to think about, like the fact that the only age, you know, that it ever said Snow White was, was seven, but technically it didn't ever say if she grew older or how much time had passed. And also, it was a very, very long time ago that this story was made. So, and, you know, also kind of weird that the prince immediately just walked up and went, marry me, after, you know, she was kind of dead. But you will hear about, you know, all of that stuff a lot, I feel. So I won't go into detail about how odd it is, I guess. Um... I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, the Brothers Grimm tales are more brutal, and it's definitely more brutal than, uh, you know, the actual movie, Um, but they mostly talk about the red hot iron shoes, you know, that the villain or evil queen had to dance upon until she died. You know, um, when I think about it, is it really so much worse than being, like, pushed off a cliff? Like, if it child can stand like a villain being pushed off a cliff and dying and nevertheless probably enjoy it because you know they think oh it's a villain and you died then do you think that they'll really mine the hot metal I mean I guess it was a fairy tale for children so I guess they didn't really mind it um I do sometimes wonder if she can deserve that by any way shape or form I'm not saying that she's good. She tried to eat a child's heart, which is very odd, but it is a bit, you know, odd that you never know how dying feels. Obviously, you're all going to do it one day, so I guess one day you'll all know how it feels, but you can't really tell if it's a fair trial, if it the punishment fits the crime, so to say. I mean, she tried to kill a seven-year-old girl for being pretty, so it's definitely not like she deserves kindness, but I can't help but wonder, you know, what death feels like and, you know, what would be a crime so bad that you give a punishment that you don't even know how bad it is, and what if it's good? It's odd. Hmm. Well, thanks for listening.